Now, I hope you guys had a, a, a happy Thanksgiving. We had a, we had a great Thanksgiving. Um, didn't, get, didn't get engaged or anything like that, but uh, um, had a great time with family. Um, I'm always reminded at Thanksgiving um, to, to say thanks to all the like, police officers and firefighters and nurses and doctors who have to work on Thanksgiving, uh, my wife being one of those. Um, not only did she work this year, but she, uh, she worked 16 hours on Thursday. Um, so quite a trooper of that. People still get sick on Thanksgiving. People still commit crimes. People's houses still burn down. So thank you for those of you who are in professions like that and have to work on Thanksgiving. Uh, but then we celebrated on Friday, and my sister and her husband came over. And then yesterday, we celebrated my son's uh, seventh birthday, and we asked him, you know, hey, what do you want to do? Anything you want to do for your birthday? And he said, you know, I just want to have some kids over to play Minecraft. He said, all right, we'll get, get a cake and play some Minecraft. But it was great. Great weekend. And for those of you who are curious, um, th- I'm not growing out the beard to look like the Abraham in the, uh, in the picture that we're using. Some people have asked me that. No, it's, it's just kind of a, uh, a, a random thing. But we are going to continue our sermon series on Abraham today. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 16. And before I forget, not only is this Thanksgiving weekend, but today is actually also the first day of Advent. Uh, and so we're going to do a special service tonight commemorating that. So tonight at 6 o'clock p.m., you're welcome to join us for a, a special Advent um, service. But a, a few months ago, we were ordaining a new elder. And uh, I got up here and I talked about the qualifications of an elder. And then after the service, uh, someone came up to me. It was actually during prayer, during the response time. And he said to me, you know, I heard you talk about these qualifications of, of an elder. And all I could think of was... I need not apply. And it broke my heart to hear him say that. Now, the scriptures do outline pretty clear guidelines for the kind of life that you need to lead um, if you're going to be an elder or a deacon in, in the church. And these guidelines are important, and I'm grateful for them. And I'm grateful for the awesome guys that we have in those roles at, at our church right now. But at the same time, it really did break my heart to hear someone say that, that my words about elders and about the qualifications reminded them of all the ways that they don't measure up. Because if there's one thing that God doesn't do, it's look down on us and think of all the ways that we don't measure up. Now, maybe this guy was right. Maybe he will never be an elder in the church. But does that mean that he's invisible? Because I think he felt invisible. I think he felt like, you know, God works through the church people, and people like me, well, we're just, we're just an afterthought, God's plan. Well, we're going to see today that that is not the case. Um, we're in the midst of the sermon series on, on Abraham, and Abraham is, this, is a really interesting guy, because on the one hand, he's one of the most important people who ever lived. I mean, there's three major world religions that, that trace their roots back to Abraham, and when you think of us, us Christians and important people in our faith, obviously Jesus is far and away the most important. But if there was like a second tier of other very important people, Abraham would be, would be right there. I mean, he's very, very important um, to, our, to our faith. And Abraham is known for his um, amazing faith. That's when we think of Abraham, we think of faith. Now, um, specifically in two different instances in his life. Um, the first one we've already talked about, where he's living in, in Ur, and God says to him, I want you to get up, and I want you to go to this land that I'm going to show you. Uh, and he does that. He acts in faith, and, he, and he's obedient in that. And then the second instance that we always um, think of with Abraham is when, is when God asks him to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, and Abraham binds his son Isaac, and then God says, no, we're going to offer a ram instead, and God provides a substitute um, sacrifice. <clears throat> so those are the things that we typically think of uh, when we think of Abraham. But despite his amazing faith, he wasn't perfect. He made mistakes. Sometimes he made big mistakes. And today we're going to look at what's probably the biggest mistake he ever made. And I want you to, I want to warn you ahead of time, um, this passage today and this this message today, um, it's going to be a little intense. All right, we're going to look at a well-known story today, but it's also a pretty terrible story. And I think that we know this story so well that it's easy for us to lose sight of how bad some of the things are in the passage. And I think we do that to our detriment. 
And so we have to remember that as we go through this, this Abraham series, that Abraham is not the hero of this story. Okay, God is. Abraham is going to do some great things, but he's also going to make some mistakes. And when Abraham experiences victories, God is like right there to cheer him on and celebrate those victories. But when Abraham makes mistakes, God is also right there to show him grace, to lift him up, to forgive him, and set him right back on the right track. <clears throat> but in the passage that we're going to look at today, God speaks, but it's interesting that when he speaks, he doesn't speak to Abraham. He speaks to someone else. He speaks to a woman who, until this point in the narrative, was invisible. And she probably thought of herself as invisible to God. But in our passage today, she's going to have a radical encounter with the living God, and, he's going to, and she's going to find out that he was with her all along. She wasn't invisible. Far from being invisible, she's going to find out that she was known and that God hears her cries. So hopefully, by now, you've had uh, time to find Genesis chapter 16. <clears throat> We're going to start off uh, by reading verses uh, 1 and 2 here, Genesis chapter 16, to get the background of this story. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, now, just stop there for a second. If, if, you're, if you're just joining us for the first week here, or you're unfamiliar with the story, um, Abram is the same guy as Abraham. He gets his name changed later, and Sarai also gets her name changed to Sarah. So if you hear me slip back and forth between Abram and Abraham, I'm going to try not to do that, but I might, but they're the same guy. <clears throat> now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, and it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of his wife, Sarai. All right, now let's stop there for a second. So in these two verses, we're introduced to the problem of this story. Okay, Sarai had not born any children. Now last week, we saw that God made a promise to Abram, all right? He said, I want you to look up, and I want you to look into the sky, and I want you to see the stars, and I want you to try to count them if you can. And he says, so, so will, um, that's how many offspring that you're going to have. That's how numerous your offspring are going to be. But right after, I mean, the very next verses, right after God makes his promise to Abram, we see this problem. Sarah has born no children, and she is not a, a spring chicken. And so this is a, this is a problem. And in the ancient world, um, infertility was not a small problem. It was a huge problem. One of, the, um, one of the most important roles of the family in the ancient world was to produce children for passing on uh, an inheritance. And so not having any children and not having anyone to pass your name to or your inheritance to was like a major source of shame in the ancient world. And we saw last week that Abraham, he was very, very concerned about this. If you remember when God makes this promise to him and he's like, hey, man, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you and do all these things. Abraham essentially says, so what? What does any of this matter when I don't have an heir? And this guy, Eleazar from D Damascus, he's the one that's going to get everything. Right? So this, I mean, that's my translation, but that's essentially what he says. Right? This is on Abraham's heart. He doesn't have, a, he doesn't have an heir, and it really bothers him. It's, it's a source of, of shame for him. And it wasn't just a problem for Abram. It was also a problem for Sarai. Okay, Sarai was under intense emotional stress because of her infertility. It was a major source of pain for her. Uh, it, it was a big deal. Now, it's interesting. We actually, archaeologists have actually uncovered um, a lot of ancient legal documents from around Abraham's time. You know, back then, not very many people were literate, and so the things that did get written down were usually either religious texts or legal texts. And so we've dug up a lot of ancient legal texts, and, and along with those, we've dug up ancient prenuptial agreements, it's one of, the, one of the more common things that we find. And one of the things that we see in a lot of these prenuptial agreements is what to do in the case of infertility, because it was such a big deal to the ancients. And one of the things that's, that's common in these prenuptial agreements is if a couple didn't have children after 10 years, that the husband could divorce the wife, and she would take her dowry back, and she would go back to live with her father, or um, you know, she'd live with her oldest brother if, if her father had passed away. Now, Abram and Sarah, they've been, they had been married for a long time. They married long, a lot longer than 10 years. They obviously loved each other very much, and we get no indication in the text that divorce is on the table for them in any way. Um, but this had to be something that Sarah carried around with her. 
right? It had to have been something that was on her heart, that she thought about. Um, it was a source of guilt and shame for her. And we see evidence of this in verse 2. Because you notice what she says in verse 2? She says, the Lord has prevented me from having children. I mean, do you, do you hear the anger in her voice there? I mean, this is a woman who's in intense emotional pain, and she's angry at God for what she's enduring. And so Abram and Sarai are, are trying to reconcile how, um, you know, how he could possibly be the father of many nations when she's unable to have children. And Sarai has this idea, right? She says, I have this slave girl. We can use her. Now, if this sounds a little disconcerting, it's because it should be, okay? Hagar was a human being. Or it's a human being whom, whom she owned, and Sarah was suggest, suggesting that she could be a means to her obtaining a child. That's the word she says. I want to obtain a child through her. Now, think of that proposition through Hagar's perspective. Now, granted, Sarah, she's going through a lot here, right? She's under a lot of stress. But her idea of using Hagar as a human incubator was not what God wanted. And not once in this text do we see that God is behind this plan. Not once do we see that God is even consulted for this plan. They didn't even run it by him. Now, if you're familiar with this text, it's really easy to gloss over this and gloss over what's going on here. But I think we need to slow down and soak this in. And I think we need to think about this from Hagar's perspective. All right, she's, she's Sarai's property. And in the ancient laws, any children that she bore would also be Sarai's property. And so her mistress tells her, you will have a sexual relationship with this man, who, by the way, is much older than you, and then we're going to borrow your body for nine months. And that morning sickness that you experience, don't worry about it too much. And those little kicks that you feel, don't get too attached. Because as soon as that baby is born, we're taking it. It's ours. Sarah says she wants to obtain a child through Hagar. She says that baby that you have is not going to be your baby. It's not going to be your offspring. It's my offspring. That's, that's a pretty serious thing to demand of someone. Now, the reason that I want us to slow down and think about this is because I think the church has a history of glossing over passages like this. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons that the church justified human slavery for so long is because we're afraid to look at passages like this honestly and say, you know, hey, that's, that's messed up. Because it is messed up, right? Hagar is a human being here. But she's not a human being to Sarai and Abram. She's a tool. She's a means of getting what they wanted. Now, to be fair to Abram and to be fair to Sarai, this was not an uncommon practice in the ancient world. Um, I mentioned earlier that, you know, these legal prenuptial agreements that we found, like they mentioned that divorce is an option. It's not the only option. Another option for couples that were going through infertility was finding a surrogate mother, especially if um, the couple owned slaves. And so this thing that, that Sarah is suggesting is not novel, like she's not the first one to come up with this. This was actually a common practice um, at the time. But that doesn't make it right. Okay. Incidentally, a these ancient prenuptial agreements also advocate for adoption, um, which was also very common in the ancient world. If you were going through infertility, you didn't have an heir, you could adopt someone to be your heir. But it doesn't seem like that's even on the table for, for um, Sarah and Abram here. And I don't know why that is. But all of this raises the question of how we read the Bible in passages like this. And so I think it's worth us talking about this, right? We, we worship a God who acts in history, in real history. And when he acts, he does so within the customs and the mores of, of real-life cultures and real historical situations. But that, but that doesn't mean that all of the customs and all of the mores of those cultures all of a sudden get God's stamp of approval on them. Okay, so here we see God acting through a guy who owns a slave, but that does not um, imply God's stamp of approval on human slavery. And in fact, 
um, as we read this passage, we're going to see that every time that God shows up in this passage, he's on Hagar's side, not Abram's. And it, it's passages like this where the indignities of human slavery is exposed that formed the basis for the theological arguments of the great abolitionists in England and then later here in the U.S., you know, guys like William Wilberforce. And so while we're calling this series Abraham, it doesn't mean that Abraham is the hero of this story. He's not. God is. Not, not everything that Abraham does is right. Uh, we're going to see some passages in the narrative where where Abraham, he's going to do, he's going to exercise amazing faith. But there's other passages like this one where he's wrong. And so as we read through these passages and as we interpret them, we always have to be reading to see where God is, right? Where's God in this passage? And in this one, he's with Hagar. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm actually comforted by this, right? I'm glad that the Bible doesn't just contain stories about people who got everything right, because that would be pretty discouraging, because I don't get everything right. And when I read stories like this one um, about Abram, it gives me hope, right? I, I feel like if God can work through this situation and bring about something good, then maybe he can work through some of the messes that I create and make something good. Am I right? Well, I'm glad for passages like this because it reminds me that God works through real people. Right? If, if all we had about Abraham were the good stories... It might be discouraging to us because of, our, our, of our, our shortcomings. I don't know for sure that I would have the same faith that Abraham did when he bound Isaac. I don't know that I would do that. But I'm pretty sure I would not do what he did here. That actually makes me feel pretty good about myself. I don't know about you. Uh, and we see this with a lot of heroes. In the, we see this with a lot of heroes in the Bible, right? Moses, he killed a guy in cold blood. Saul, he dabbled in witchcraft. David killed a lot of people. And he conspired to kill, uh, to murder Uriah the Hittite. Uh, Solomon married 700 women, worshipped foreign gods. In the New Testament, we see, you know, James, the half-brother of Jesus. We just did a ser sermon series on James. Um, the whole time he shows up in the Gospels, every time he's, like, trying to do damage control as Jesus' half-brother, telling people he's crazy and apologizing on his behalf. And we don't know when it happened, probably after the resurrection. Somewhere in there, James came around, and he converted to Christianity. But Jesus' whole life, as far as we know, he, uh, he thought Jesus was crazy. Uh, Peter denied Jesus to his face. The Apostle Paul was a terrorist. It, but you know, God was able to redeem all of these stories. And so when you look at your own life, when I look at my life, and you, and you see your shortcomings, when I see my shortcomings, these aren't scandalous to God, right? He, he's seen it all before. He's worked with people way worse than you. He works with the most unlikely people. Now, it's interesting. Um, this passage that we're looking at here today parallels Genesis 12 in a lot of ways. Remember, Genesis 12 is one of the first passages we looked at. And in that one, um, God says to Abram, Abram, I want you to get up and I want you to go to this land that I'm going to show you. And Abram, he's obedient. He gets up and he goes. But what happens as soon as he gets there? There's a famine. And so it introduces this test of, is Abram going to trust God for the land? And we saw in that passage that he didn't. He went down to Egypt um, and didn't trust God. And so here we almost have like a repeat of that cycle. Genesis 15, God says, I'm going to multiply your heirs, your offspring. And then chapter 16, it's, Sarah hasn't had any children. And so now the question becomes, is, becomes, is Abram going to trust God for the heirs, for the, for the offspring? Well, let's see what he does here. Verses 3 through 5, chapter, chapter 16 still. And so, after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. All right, so in these verses, we see things start to unravel a little bit with, with Abram and Sarah's plan. Um, Abram, he listens to his wife, impregnates her slave, and then when Hagar realizes that she's pregnant, she starts to get a little bit of attitude with, with Sarah. Now, keep in mind, here is a girl who has been robbed of her humanity. She has been forced into a relationship with an older man, forced to carry their baby, valued for nothing other than her womb. 
And when you've been humiliated like that, you look for any opportunity to scrape up some dignity. And so she sees this sore spot in, in Sarah, and she starts to poke it, okay? She says things like, well, you may never be a slave, Sarah, but you'll never be a mother either. This is an intense story, right? I mean, they're making movies of like Noah, and they're, I guess they're making a movie of Exodus now. Like, where's the movies of passages like this? I mean, this is intense drama here. This is real life. Well, this arrangement with Hagar, it doesn't work out quite the way Sarai thought it would, and she loses it. Right? Her, her pain of infertility just becomes too much, and she just flips out on Abram. And she says, this is all your fault. You hear these things that she's saying to me? I, I trusted you with her, and now look what she's doing to me. And so now surely this man of God, he, he's going to be able to sit down with these two women and help them work through this awful situation, right? I mean, Hagar, she's just doing what she's told. She didn't want to be pregnant, right? Is Abram going to stand up for her? Well, let's look here, verse, verse 6. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So Abram, he doesn't, he doesn't defend this, this girl that's carrying his child. Instead, he just he, he shrugs his shoulders, and he's like, Whatever you want to do, honey. And he just kind of shirks responsibility, and he hands her over to be mistreated by Sarah. Now, it's funny, like a couple weeks ago, we looked at this passage where Abram, like he didn't even give it a second thought to saddle up 300 of his closest friends and like chase after these Middle Eastern warlords to save his nephew Lot. But here, like he's not even going to stand up to his wife, right? Fighting against the Bronze Age equivalent of ISIS, not scary to him. Fighting against his wife, very scary to him, right? Maybe, maybe that shouldn't be surprising. I don't know. But, but, but Abram doesn't stand up to Sarai, and, and, and she takes all this anger that she has stored up against God because of her infertility, and she takes it out on Hagar. And she reminds her, she says, Hagar, you are my property. Your baby is my baby. It's my offspring. She dealt harshly with Hagar, and Hagar fled for her life. And this text, it raises an important question, and it's, it's, this is another side note, but I think it's a crucial question for our age, and one that we don't always talk about. Do God's blessing, God's favor, and God's covenant give you the right to do whatever you want? Right? In the last passage, we see this, that God makes this agreement with Abram. He's like, Abram, you are my man. I am unconditionally committed to you and to your good forever. No ifs. No ands, no buts, I am with you. Well, what does that mean for the Hagars of the world? Does that mean that God is against them? Well, there's one more interesting thing about this text, and that's in verse 6, where it says that Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar. Some translations say that um, she afflicted her. Okay. And the word that it uses to describe Sarai afflicting Hagar is the same word that's used in Exodus to describe what the Egyptians were doing to um, the Israelites. And I remember you've heard me say this before, that Exodus was one of the most important books to the Hebrew people. Um, they thought one of the most important things that God ever did in history was when they were being afflicted and they cried out to God and God heard their cries and he delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And so here we see the same word being used. Only here, it's a Hebrew doing the afflicting, and it's an Egyptian being afflicted. How's God going to respond to that? Does he listen to the affliction of the Hagars of the world, or does he only hear the cries and the prayers of the Abrams of the world? Well, let's start reading in verse 7. Now, the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, what, what are you, where have you come from? What are you, where are you going? And she said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring. Whose offspring? Sarai's offspring? He says, I will multiply your offspring. That's your baby that you're carrying 
so that they cannot be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you're pregnant, and you shall bear a son. And you call, shall call his name Ishmael, which means um, God hears, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. And he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hands against everyone and everyone's hands against him. And he shall dwell over against all of his kinsmen. God heard her affliction. And he says to Hagar, you're not just a slave to me. You're not just a womb. You're not just a tool. You're my daughter. And I hear you. And he says, I don't want you to ever forget this. And so this child that you're carrying against your will, I want you to go back and I want you to have this child and I want you to raise him. And I want you to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. So that every time you see him and you think about this day, you will remember that I hear you. And then we get this shocking promise that God makes to Hagar, where he says, that, says to her that he will multiply her offspring so that they can't be numbered. This is the same promise that he made to Abram in the last chapter, and now he's making it to Hagar. Now, this doesn't change anything that we looked at last week, right? God is still committed to Abram. Abram's still his man. The promise is still through Abram and Sarai, not Hagar. But this does not mean that Hagar isn't important. And so this passage shows us that even though God works through the Abrams of the world, he still hears the cries of the Hagars. In God's words to Hagar, we see his judgment on her situation. He says, Abram and Sarai were wrong. Hagar was right. Even though the promise wasn't made to her, even though Abram was the chosen one, even though Sarai would ultimately be the mother of the promised child, even though all of those things were still true, in this instance, they were wrong. And Hagar was right. And there's a lesson for us here. God hears the cries of the Hagars. You know, in the Bible, we see this consistent thread that God works through invisible people like Hagar. Slaves, children, powerless. Like in the, in the election of Israel, God says, guys, I didn't pick you because you were the most important nation. I picked you because you were the smallest nation. We see in his selection of David, he doesn't pick the, his biggest and strongest older brothers. He picks the youngest brother. In the incarnation, which we're going to start thinking about today in Advent, God didn't come to earth as a king or a general as a, or as a celebrity. You know, he, he was born in a barn. He was a Mediterranean peasant. His mom was an unwed teenager. And in Jesus' ministry, we see him acting the same way. He consistently hung out with and celebrated the invisible, whether they were children, the poor, prostitutes, the chronically ill, or the scandalously irreligious. Right? And that's the way God works. His grace is not just for the wise. It's not just for the powerful. It's not just for the righteous or the holy or the religious. It's for the Hagars of the world. And I love how Philip Yancey words this. He says, grace, like water, flows to the lowest part. Now, a lot of people in this room here today have been treated like Hagars before. Like they were only valuable as a tool, a means for someone else to get what they wanted. And if that's you, I want to let you know that God is on your side. God's grace always flows down to the Hagars of the world. He hears their cries and he sees their afflictions. And it's sad that I have to say this, but I do. That that is even the case when the one doing the afflicting is the church. Sadly, too many churches feel like because they're doing the Lord's work, it doesn't matter how they treat people. God is always on their side. And now I pray that you will never experience that here. But I also recognize that with just how mobile people are, most of you probably are not here forever. You're someday you're going to move on. You're going to go somewhere else. So you need to hear this. God is never on the side of injustice, regardless of who, who is doing it. Right? Sadly, too many churches feel that because they're doing the Lord's work, that God is on their side and people just need to submit to that. Guys, that is a lie straight out of hell. God is never on the side of injustice. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Abram himself. God hears the cries of the Hagars. Now, if I had a microphone in my hand, I would just drop it and walk off stage right now. 
<laughs> but I don't. And I got a couple more verses to talk about. So we're going to look at that. No, ser- in all seriousness, I want, you, I want you guys to hear where my heart is on this. Hagar saw, she saw Abram interact with God, right? She knew where Abram stood with God. She knew the promises. She knew that God was on his side. And so when she was mistreated by Abram and Sarah, she must have thought, I guess this is what God thinks of me too. But it's not. It's not. Now, this story has a happy ending. It really does have a happy ending. So let's read these last couple verses, verses 13 through 16. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here, I have been seen by him who looks after me. She's not invisible. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lachai Roi. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Okay, so, so first it tells us that Hagar... Um, she, she has this well, and she names it Be'er Lahai Roi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. She realized that she wasn't invisible. She realized that the Lord was watching over her. And then when she goes back, she goes back to Sarah and Abraham, just like God told her to, and she finds out that, yes, God indeed is watching over her. And how do we know that? Well, what do we see? She has this baby, and Abram names the baby Ishmael, just like the angel of the Lord said that she should name him. Right? And the name means God hears. Now, how did Abram know to name the baby Ishmael? Because he's the one that names it, not, not, not Hagar. Well, either God also appeared to him and said, hey, you guys mistreated Hagar. I've heard her, and this is what you need to name her baby. Or, you know, Hagar explained it to him, and, and he realized at that point that he was in the wrong. But he names the baby Ishmael, recognizing that God heard Hagar's cries. And it's interesting, we never see after this Sarah trying to lay claim on this baby. By naming him Ishmael, Abram seems to admit that he was wrong, that God was on Hagar's side in all of this, and that Sarah and and he were wrong to demand Hagar to have the son for him. And they just needed to trust God to fulfill his promise. Just like God heard Hagar's cries, they realized that he would hear their cries as well. And this brings us back to chapter 15. You remember in that chapter that God was the only one who walked through those animal pieces. He made a one-sided commitment to Abram. And yeah, Abram messed up really bad here, but God was not done with him yet. Now today, is, it's, like I said, it's the first Sunday of Advent. And so when I read this passage, I'm reminded of the, just the mess that God walked into when he took on flesh. Right? I mean, Abram, Sarah, Her- Hagar, I mean, this, this is like a, a snake pit of MTV reality show proportions, right? And this is the kind of, of, this is the family that God chose to work through for the rest of history. And it just reminds me of just the mess that Jesus came into. It's relationships like this that he continues to enter into. And so whether you're an Abram and you have just messed up big time, or you are a Sarai and, and life has not panned out the way that you thought it would, and you carry wounds, and you hurt the people around you because of them, or if you're a Hagar, and when people look at you, they don't see a person, they just see a tool, a way to get what they want. I don't care what your story is. You are not beyond God's grace. This story ends well. God creates beauty out of this wreckage that we see here. And he can do that in your story. Now, in a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper and have a time of response. And at this time, we're, we're reminded of, um, of our need for God's grace. Okay, and we find it at the table here. None of us bring anything to the table except our need, and we don't find anything there from God but grace. Manifested through the death of Jesus on the cross on our behalf and his resurrection from the dead and victory over sin and death. Now, during this time of response, um, I'd also love to pray for you. Um, If there's something on your heart, whether it's big, small, whatever, I'd love to pray for you. I'll be standing over here by these Christmas trees. Gary will be standing over there behind those Christmas trees. He'd also love to pray for you. Um, Now, specifically, if you're here today and you have just, you've just never cried out to God for forgiveness of your sins, whether it's because you just never felt the need to, or maybe because, like Hagar, you didn't think God would listen to you. 
I want to tell you today that he will listen to you. And I'd love to tell you how you can become a child of God. Because when God looks at you, that's what he sees. That's what he sees. He doesn't see a tool. He sees a child. And I'd love to help you get to know him. Will you stand with me as we prepare for the Lord's Supper?